albums that we've released and EPs, I think that each one that we've released is an excellent indicator of what the band is like at that time. So like in 2009, we released Attack of the Awesome. And I think in 2009, that's exactly what the band was. And um, you know, I like songs from all of our releases. Anything before Attack of the Awesome, I would say, don't listen to if you haven't yet. It's just, you know, we didn't know how to play and we were still learning how to record and all that stuff. But, you know, those exist and I'm proud of them because at the time I needed to learn how to do those things. Um, but if you're a new fan, if you're a new listener, I would suggest first our album Second Family that just came out last year. And then I would suggest I'm Not Alone, the one before that, and then Attack of the, Attack of the Awesome. I would suggest that one as well. But yeah, I think they're all fun and exciting and I think you'll find the same spirit exists through all of them. And that is there's funny songs, there's serious songs, there's exciting songs. And uh, yeah, we never take ourselves too seriously. So I think as long as you're listening to a, any Pat and Penning song, you kind of know where, what's going on. <sighs> That's tough. And I'll tell you why. I will, I'll throw myself under the bus here. I like those shows. I watch them. Uh, I watch them because I know what the music industry is really like from being in it. And then I know this fake uh, imaginary music industry they create for these shows, which is American Idol and stuff like that. And, you know, that's way different than what we do. What they're making is great television. You know, that has nothing to do with the music industry. Every once in a while, one of them, like, like Carrie Underwood or Kelly Clarkson, will come out with an incredible song. Or that girl from here, what's her name? Uh, uh, Cher, Cher Lloyd. She has that song. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? I want you back. I want, it's a great song. But, you know, she's from an X Factor thing. Simon Cowell found her over here. Um, I think that if you had a band one, it'd be one of two things. Um, it'd either be extremely boring, because it's real. And it's about bands like us who want to do what we love the way that we want to do it. And that's not always the mainstream way of doing things. That's not always the uh, primetime television way of doing things. You know, like sometimes we got to go to bed early because we got to wake up in the morning at 6 a.m. to load into a festival. That's boring television. Um, or it would be the bullshit side of rock and roll, which doesn't really exist anymore. And that's uh, you know, the drugs and the hookers and the fangirls and roadies and groupies and drugs and bullshit. Like, that's not a real thing that doesn't exist. Like, sure, bands party and bands drink, um, but, you know, the, the thing that would make for great television would be a, a train wreck. You know, it'd essentially be the Jersey Shore of music. And that's not a thing. So. What I think is more money should be put into developing bands. Um, like that contest that we did with Billboard was great because they let us be us. And they just kind of, like when we won the competition we were about to play on the Billboard Awards, they let us be us, but they pushed us in a better direction. Like they were like, you know what, maybe you shouldn't look like a dirtbag today and you should brush your hair. You know, that's, they didn't say you should change your songs. They didn't say you should change your show at all. And I think that was cool because they put a lot of time and effort into helping our band become what would be acceptable by mainstream TV for that night. So I think that would be cool, but that would be a difficult way to sell television because it's not going to be girls on The X Factor fighting because they want to be on Britney Spears' team instead of being on Simon Cowell's team. And I don't know. That's a good question. Yes. Oh, my God. Bowling for Soup, the greatest people we've ever met. And... People have seen me do this interview now a hundred times because they ask, what's it like to in Born Pursuit? Every day is the best day. Like the day that we had yesterday was the best day that we've ever had with them. And today, we'll probably find a way to make it better than yesterday. Like yesterday, we got these tour tattoos um, where we all got these little hands on our, on our legs uh, because Born Pursuit is the band that you can wave to. Um, but yeah, like, you know, we all decided that we should get the same stupid Mickey Mouse glove on our hands because that'd be a great thing for us friends to have for each other. So, you know, this is just a relationship you build with these people. And like, every day, Jared's like, oh, how was the day? I was like, Jared, today was the best day of tour ever. And every day, it's like, you're lying. And I was like, no, I'm not. Why do you say that? He's like, because every day you tell me that. And seriously, every day it's better with that band. So they're amazing people. And you had another part of the question, which is how do you see getting along with people in the music industry and stuff like that? You'll know within the first day of meeting someone if you're going to get along with them in music. Um, because like I was saying before, there are people that are here to do what Bowling for Soup does. And that's be themselves and rock the fuck out and melt people's faces as they're doing it. And that's what we want to do. That's what all of our friends want to do. And then there's other people 
who are, you know, they're here to, uh, I'm not saying, you know, bands can't be interested in girls, but there's bands who come out here and they're like, I'm going to try and bang three girls tonight. And then the next day they're like, I'm going to try and bang another three girls. And it's like, that's not what we're doing. You know, that's a different thing. So you'll know very quickly in the music industry if you're going to be friends with people and you'll know exactly what type of person you are the first time you go on the road. We're pretty boring. <laughs> we like beer and sometimes we watch sports and we love Harry Potter. So, <laughs> you know, we're kind of like 16 year old kids. I think that patent pinning fans are very involved and that's on purpose like we've always wanted for the band to never be bigger than the community we want the community to do the thing so that's why the album's called second family because um, what we do we don't really play music we, we show up to places where we have family and we hang out for an hour at a time and then we go to the next place and we hang out for an hour at a time we wish we spent more time so you will become, if you become a serious patent pending fan, you will become a member of the family. And it, it's the type of thing that when we roll into town, you're probably going to show up. And like, you know, if you're not there, we'll probably call you on the phone. <laughs> what are you not, what are you doing? Um, so you'll, you'll, the, the dangers of becoming a patent pending fan is you're inheriting six to seven really weird cousins from New York. <laughs> this is an amazing story. When I was a kid, we had just started playing, and it was right before Bowling for Soup blew up. I know it's insane. I'm not trying to tie in the story. This is just a really crazy thing I did. Um, I found out that Bowling for Soup was coming to town, and I found out they were coming in like two weeks, and we had just played the venue that they were playing, and they let younger bands open up there because it was right before they blew up, so they weren't huge yet. So they needed local bands to play every night to try and bring people down. And uh, I got, I had gotten drunk enough to dance probably three days before I found out they were coming to town. And I was in love with the song Life After Lisa, which they've been playing on this tour, which is cool. I went down to the venue and they were like, you can't play, you just played. I was like, listen, I'll give you all, because you have to sell 50 tickets to play at the venue. I was like, I will give you all the money up front if you let us play this show. And they were like, fine. So out of pocket. I laid out, what's 50 times 10, 500? Or is it 5,000? How much money is that? I think it's 500. 500. Yeah, I laid out, and I was a kid, I was a little kid, I didn't have $500. I borrowed money from my friends and my family. I was like, guys, I'll pay you back. I didn't know I was gonna pay them back because no one knew who Born for Soup was. And no one wanted to see our band because we were terrible. So I put out $500 of my own money so I could play with Born for Soup because I was that big of a fan when I was a kid. What's crazy about it is I think, and this goes along with the dangers of being a Pat and Penning fan um, that you were talking about with letter D. Um, you kind of, you understand right away that when we sing One Less Heart to Break, and when I wrote that song uh, with Josh, we wanted to really come from a sincere place. And we have a lot of history um, in my family and in my circle of friends with depression and attempted suicide, and unfortunately suicide. And um, it's just one of those things that we didn't care if the song was massive. We wanted to put it out for people who needed it. And it was a way for us to deal with what was going on, and it was a way to try and help people to prevent what was going on for us happening to other people. Um, and the, the reaction to that has been insane. Where kids come up to us and there's like, you know, it's a patent painting show and a Boeing for Soup show. On this tour, I'll talk about it, the particular experience. And that's just, kids are like, Wah! like we're having the greatest time in the world. I mean, Boeing for Soup's on stage singing about wieners. And we're on stage singing about shake weights. Uh, do you guys have shake weights here? Okay. The, okay. Um, so, you know, it's a joyous experience. But also, we play One Less Hard to Break. So, kids come up to you all night like, you guys are nutter. You're mental. You're crazy. And then this girl came up to us in, um, Corey, what was the place? Uh, it was in... 53, it was in Preston. A girl came out to us and she had scars on her arm from here to here. Like just razor scars from, she was self-harming. And she came out to me and she just, she just broke down crying and was like, your song, One Less Hard to Break, has saved my life. And that's one experience, one example of what that song means, like the feedback, like that, that, that feedback is what keeps us going. Cause over here we're playing these huge venues and everything's going great and 
I think some people are fooled into believing that we're a famous band that has money and we, you know, we know what we're doing. But in the States, like, you know, we're broke dudes and we don't do this for money. We don't make any. Like, so we do this for that exact moment. Like we do that for the fun moments and we do that for the, the moments that will help save someone from a, a dark moment in their life. So the feedback is really what keeps us going. That's pretty much our payment for being in this band. Your entire life. I mean, we've been in this band for 11 years. When you're in a band for a year, you have a gamble of a couple paychecks. Like, oh, I'm gonna miss work. Or, oh, I have to put down $300 so we can get t-shirts and try and be a proper band. Um, at this point, we're 11 years deep. Like, me and Anthony, who have been here since the beginning, we've gambled our lives away on this. And that's, you know, we're praying that this is gonna end up working out. And we put our personal relationships at home on hold. We put, um, you know, being an adult on hold so we can still chase this dreamer. Essentially, we're Peter Pan at this point. So we are gambling our, our, our entire lives on this. Hey, it's the ups and downs of living.